Hey there, Hour of History listeners. This is your host, Stephen Bauman, and this week we have for you Dr. Kate Brown, who's just written Manual for Survival, a Chernobyl Guide to the Future, available at fine bookstores everywhere around the world. And it's a really cool book. It's about a really pertinent issue, Chernobyl and nuclear power. I first came across Kate Brown's work with a different award-winning book she's written called Plutopia. Uh, And that was in a great uh, Russian history seminar taught by Professor Bridget O'Keefe at Brooklyn College. So this was a much anticipated interview and I think you're going to enjoy it. Make sure you head on over to hourofhistory.com forward slash subscribe so you get notifications about all these great episodes, a new one out every Saturday. On Hour of History, it's our world, anytime, any place. Enjoy. You're listening to the Hour of History podcast, our world, anytime, any place. For show notes, links, and more, be sure to visit our website at www.hourofhistory.com. And for all the book recommendations made during the podcast, head over to hourofhistory.com forward slash rex. That's hourofhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. Without further delay, your Hour of History starts right now. Hello and welcome to Hour of History. Sitting with me is Dr. Kate Brown, who's just written Manual for Survival, A Chernobyl Guide to the Future. Welcome. Thanks for having me on your show, Stephen. It's great to have you. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, it, it's it, you know this is really cool for me because I read your book Plutopia back in in grad school, and and now I got to read the follow up. For listeners who aren't familiar with your work, um, and you've written a number of books, could you explain a little bit about your historical background? Well, I'm um, I'm a historian who also works in the field of anthropology with you know anthropological methods. And I've been interested for a long time in modernist wastelands. You know, how did we get to these, the situation where we kind of ravage places and, and dispose of them and, and move on. And I wrote in, uh, a collection of essays called Dispatches from Dystopia, uh, why I think I've had this almost an obsession with modernist wastelands. And I finally realized it's because I, I grew up in a, in a mini version of one myself in, in the uh, Brust Belt of the Midwest, and the year I was born, the the watch factory that was the economic engine of my hometown, Elgin, Illinois, sh- was shuttered and the um, you know sort of blown up, and that was the main industry in town. And so uh, my whole childhood, I just watched businesses go bankrupt and and people move out of town and the economy become sidelined, and all, everybody waiting all the time for it to to come back. And I think that's, um, you know, kind of the, the motivation that got me uh, interested in looking at places where the disaster was so outsized that you couldn't miss it. And, and that way I could kind of figure out a little bit about my own past. Hmm. It's very interesting. And a lot of people, I think, uh, can empathize with that, seeing these transitions that happen. Some of them are very sudden and some aren't so sudden, you know, some have been over time and people losing their jobs and industries changing. Uh, and, but you have a focus as well in Eastern Europe. Where did that come from? Well, when I was in grad school, I mean, undergrad, I just started um, as a you know, freshman at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Ronald Reagan was elected and he was amping up the nuclear arms race and, and the Cold War, which had died down, you know, in, in the 70s. And that got me real concerned. I was worried that we would all become you know, victims of some nuclear Armageddon. So I started studying Russian and I thought, well, I'll just go there and see if there really is an evil empire. And, mm. and I went, I studied there and it wasn't an evil empire. And that just got me going. And I, you know, I expected just to go back home and get a job, in, an office job in Chicago and continue my life. Uh, but I sort of got wrapped up in the whole Gorbazm and um, I started working in Russia, you know, after uh, I finished my degree and, uh, and then I went back to grad school. Hmm. And it seems like there is a magnetic sort of pull. Uh, certainly the historians I've known who study Russia seem to get pulled in deeper and deeper. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your experience being over there as a graduate student back when it's Soviet Union? Well, it was, um, you know, it was sort of a little bit difficult in that it was kind of cold and there wasn't many choices in food and there wasn't much in the way of entertainment. And it was very hard to communicate with the United States. 
And when I, after I finished my undergrad degree, I got a job with the student exchange program. It was the first fully reciprocal exchange between the U.S. and the USSR. And <clears throat> we were just starting this. It was all seat of the pants kind of thing. It was just me and a, a retired diplomat. And the problem was, is that the two systems were so different. It was really hard to think them up. So we wanted to send American undergrads right into uh, Soviet universities and Soviet universities had this group system. And so th they had a very set uh, uh, list of courses and the students were studying along in a group and, and we were used to an a la carte menu, of course, of choosing classes, you know, based on whatever you were interested in. And it was very difficult to get, you know, these two systems together on, on, on so many levels. And that was a really fascinating uh, study for me of, of really thinking across these boundaries. And, and as you can see with Plutopia, and the first major article I, I published, Gridded Lives, I, I, I started thinking across boundaries a great deal as I myself was flying back and forth um, and trying to get these two systems that were so different and had been so divided for decades to think up. And we had all kinds of problems too, you know, uh, American students who had uh, got tangled up with the KGB and, and with the Soviet medical system, which was disastrous at the time, and uh, with border problems and with problems with love affairs. And we had Soviet students come to the United States, and, and they too were to go straight into American colleges. And um, some of them were so specialized in what they did that we just had to send them in to Harvard to do DNA research that they couldn't study in a small American <laughs> college. And others... Uh, you know, I had problems, you know, like going into a store where you could just pick up anything um, and put it into a cart that, you know, that wasn't possible in the Soviet Union. And so we had problems with students like slipping things into their pockets <laughs> and, get, and getting tangled with the American police forces. And so it was, it was my job um, to go, you know, check on these students after three months and six months and, and solve their problems, which were often pretty, you know, complicated. And so I traveled all over the Soviet Union in 1988 to 1991 and that was the time when the soviet union was you know going you know everything was going viral politically people were on the streets um spontaneous meetings demonstrations um protests strikes labor strikes and uh lots of ethnic discord and i was traveling around like we had students in yakutsk i went to yakutsk or moldova or, or georgia or the Baltics. And I noticed everywhere I went, people were, you know, digging bones out of the courtyard of a monastery and pointing to the bullet holes in the skulls and saying, look, this, you know, this is what our communist party did. Wow. Um, and they were using history to discredit the regime in power. And I realized at that point how powerful history was, not just as something that occurred in the past that was sort of dusted off and you can revive and say, look how interesting this is, but as a political force in the present. Hmm. And I thought, oh, I, I got to get a piece of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. Um, and one of the things that's great about your books, and maybe this is the anthropology or the basis that you kind of just talked about about moving around and meeting people is you have these really personal stories um, of the people you meet and you conduct so many interviews in a variety of, of places that you researched um, but let's focus a little bit on the latest work on Chernobyl so it's a it's sort of a super wildly popular it's captured the imagination of a lot of people you know there's the new HBO uh, releasing series that's happening right now. Um, how did you come to it? And, and a second question on that is how did you make it personal? Well, I think you pointed out in your introduction that, you know, after Plutopia, you read, you know, Manual for Survival and, and Manual for Survival really is a sequel to Plutopia. And that when Plutopia is a, is a history of the first two cities in the world to produce plutonium, it's an American one, Richland that had the, a Hanford plutonium factory and the Soviet one was Azorsk and they had the Mayak plutonium factory. And as I worked that story over about six years, I, I would meet farmers in Siberia and in Eastern Washington. And they would tell me about their health problems that they associated with ex radioactive exposures from the plant. And the, the health problems sounded nutty, you know, vague, complex, 
um, disorders of multiple organs, you know, basically that left people feeling chronically unwell uh, and their offspring chronically unwell for decades. And I asked, you know, doctors and scientists about it and they said, you know, there's really no basis. There's really no evidence for this. These people are, are just stupid farmers mm. who, you know, don't take care of themselves or they're anxious about their exposures and they're kind of attributing everything that they have to radioactivity. Well, that's fair enough. I, I, you know, I thought, well, you know, I guess that could be a cause, but I realized there wasn't a whole lot of medical data. Like, you know, the scientists hadn't really been very curious about this and I couldn't find that much. Um, I found some information in Pluto, you know, for Pluto, but I couldn't find that much. Um, as I said, because I, you know, scientists, especially in America were, you know, were not curious about what was happening, you know, off site as they would call it, you know, and they would say, you know, over and over again, that was their line during the cold war is radioactivity doesn't leave the site. Uh, and we know that that was patently false. Uh, but we also know that they didn't know how much radiation left the site because they didn't really bother to monitor it too much. So I thought, well, Chernobyl was a, you know, a very different scenario. It was a civilian site. It happened much later. It wasn't like a slow motion disaster. It, it occurred, you know, one big accident with the press watching. And, and, and there was, had to be a lot of accountability because there was so much global scrutiny of the Chernobyl disaster. So I, I went in 2014 into the archives in Kiev. I'd worked there before. And that was another reason I, I had an interest is my first book, A Biography of No Place, ends with a, a short epilogue about Chernobyl because it's about the gradual depopulation of a, of a very densely populated multi-ethnic border borderland that was turned into a, a, a you know, homogenous Ukrainian heartland that was kind of sparsely populated. And the last chapter of that, of course, was the depopulation caused by Chernobyl itself. So, you know, I had a lot of experience in those, that area that's called Policia, that, where the plant was built and where the accident occurred. Hmm. So I knew those archives and I walked in and I said, you know, I'd like the medical records on the Chernobyl disaster. And the women who at the archive who I knew for several decades by that time and kind of laughed at me and said, you're not going to find anything. You know, this was a banned topic during the, the, the Soviet period. And I said, well, let's just take a look at the finding aids. And, and we did. And, and it didn't take a great sleuth. Within about three minutes, we found, you know, whole document collections of titles and plain Ukrainian, you know, the medical consequences of the Chernobyl catastrophe hmm. and huge files, bound files. And I started reading and realized I would be at this project for years. <laughs> I was. And, it, you know, the archivists didn't know, you know, so they were trying to deceive me. They, they didn't know these files existed because nobody had really ever signed them out before. Hmm. You know, often I was the first person to sign, sign these files. There was one other uh, very important historian in Ukraine, Natalia Baranovskaya, and she had um, done some work in them, but she, she was the only one working on the topic and she was really overwhelmed. And, um, and she wrote a, a, a collection and, and a work about the medical consequences, but there was so much more to tell. So I started um, working through those files and I, I hired a, a research assistant in Ukraine and another one in Belarus. And I, we started working really furiously, working from the, you know, Moscow down to the Republic level, to the oblast or the province level, and then to the county hospital records. Um, and we went you know, to Minsk and, and, and Russia and, and Ukraine, we focused on, hmm. and just found reams and reams and reams of data. And, and what it showed is that over time, local researchers and doctors and public health officials tracked this. They'd say, look, you know, in 1985, we had this many kids, you know, 80% of the population of the childhood population was, was healthy and 20% had some kind of chronic illness. Now it, by 1989, that number has switched and we have 80% with the chronic illness and 20% that can be categorized as healthy. And look, you know, look at these problems, problems of the endocrine system, of the thyroid, uh, respiratory, digestive tract, circulation system, and, mm -hmm. uh, and then cancers by 1989, uh, yeah. leukemias and, and childhood pediatric thyroid cancers. And then, you know, pregnant women were another serious category that had problems with uh, conception, carrying babies full terms, uh, successfully giving birth to babies, and then babies with, um, that failed to thrive, and babies with birth defects. Mm 
Um, and so you're charting these through medical records all in this same region that would have been or was affected by the fallout of Chernobyl. Um, right. is, is there any sort of reading between the lines you have to do in the archives? Are, were the doctors free to kind of draw conclusions? Did they draw conclusions at all? Did they relate it to the incident? No, they weren't, they weren't really free to draw conclusions. You're absolutely right. It was, it was a banned topic. All of these archives were written um, uh, for office use only, which is a level of classification. So they had to be, you know, in a locked safe. And um, you, the way Soviet epidemiology and public health worked, and I know this from talking to uh, Soviet, former Soviet epidemiologists, is that you were supposed to report that the Soviet population is getting happier and healthier every day. And every year, so every year you're supposed to say, oh, you know, we're, everything's on the rise. And if you had problems, you were supposed to sort of, you know, massage the numbers. Hmm. And if you didn't, your, your boss would give you a reprimand and your boss would have massaged the numbers. And, and indeed, I saw that as the, as the numbers flowed up the chain of command, you know, towards Kiev and then towards Moscow or, or towards Minsk and then Moscow the numbers got better and the conclusions got much rosier. You know, you, you would, they would say, yeah, we, you know, we checked 900,000 people, uh, gave them medical exams who were, you know, exposed to Chernobyl contaminants and we saw no change in health you know, mm. statistics. But then if you looked at the records that were submitted under that um, conclusion, you found that the records looked really dismal um, or that they had been changed from those that had been sent to Kiev, for instance. Um, so, and I realized that it took a, a great deal of courage for these local doctors and scientists and public health officials to report this bad news, that, that they were doing it against the sort of ethos and the values and the expected, you know, um, uh, you know expected um, results that they were supposed to give. And so when they, and most doctors were doing this, there were some were saying, yeah, everything's fine. Um, but they were rare. And increasingly the, the urgency of these messages um, start to, by 1989, really get, you know, sort of more and more dire. And by 1990, in, in Belarus especially, they're drawing conclusions. They're saying we can't rule out Chernobyl as a factor in these, in these um, increasing frequencies of disease. Hmm. And so I started to believe it myself. And then I, you know, I, I, so I, you know, I thought, well, there's all these people writing letters to the to the archive saying, please move us, or, or here's our health problems, or here's our problems with local contaminants caused by Chernobyl. They were quite well informed, these local populations of, mm -hmm. of mostly farmers and townspeople. So I got a list of people, and my research assistant, Olya Martinuk, she you know, drew up, found people who were still living in these places. And we went and took a long car trip through Northern Ukraine. And then um, with my other research assistant, Katya Kravichanina, we went through southern Belarus and we tried, we found people who were on these lists and, um, and asked them, you know, what life was like today and, and do they still want to move and, and these kinds of questions. And yeah, and so this is sort of helps me get these sort of stories where you know, people are talking directly. You know, absolutely. And the personal stories that, you know, go across these in, these boundaries are, are fascinating in the book. Um, one of the things that you describe is this zone of alienation, which which you call it's just a circle drawn on a map. And um, so can you talk a little bit about that as you're traveling across these boundaries, you're seeing uh like one might expect, nature is not confined to these zones drawn by humans. Yeah, you know, we're led to believe and, you know, you, you, you see a lot, you know, um, UN reports and people in, in favor of nuclear power, we're led to believe that Chernobyl contaminants are safely contained within the Chernobyl zone or this zone of alienation, which was a 30 kilometer circle that was drawn on the map and depopulated in the weeks after the accident. But that's, you know, patently false, I found. Um, in fact, pilots went up right after the accident and manipulated the weather because they saw a big storm front heading towards the big Russian cities of Yaroslav, Voronezh, and Moscow. And if radioactive rain fell on those cities, with millions of people could have been harmed. So they seeded the clouds so that radioactive rain fell on, on rural Belarus rather than urban Russia. Now, that was a, a triage decision. It was probably not a bad decision 
um, in terms of lives that were you know, spared and health that was saved. But they, the only problem is they didn't tell anyone in Belarus they had done this. Mm. Even the, the leader of the Belarusian Communist Party had to call up three days after the accident, he had to call Kiev and said, what's going on? Why are radiation monitors, you know, going, you know, ne- you know the needles are, are going off the charts. Um, and so that was the, the major problem. They, they depopulated this area right around the zone, but an area that was nearly as radioactive in the Mogilev province of Southern Belarus, people were left and, uh, and you know, a general writes in and says, you know, this situation is dire. A uh, reporter from Izvestia who was sent to Mogilev province to report, you know, good news that, you know, the farmers are making their quotas on time. He writes and he says, I wrote, I filed my story, but I'm writing you to tell you it's really bad there and they don't know what to do and they need help. Hmm. Um, you know, these messages just, you know, show up over and over again in the summer of 1986. Um, and the really tragic story is that there's a second zone, Chernobyl zone, a zone of alienation that's been depopulated, but it was only depopulated by 1999. Mm. So 15 years people lived in um, conditions of terrific radioactivity. You know, scientists say it's, it's not healthy to live in areas with more than one curie per square kilometer, certainly no more than five curies per square kilometer. There people were living in, in areas with 40 or, and 140 curies per square kilometer. Mm. And you talk about it as well. There, there's not just people in these areas, but there's food particles, there's wool, and there's meat. And that, those don't just stay in the area. So no. h- how did those decisions get made? And how does that spread this uh, radiation? Yeah, well, I went to, um, I worked also in the Ministry of Archives Records, you know, have, heavily. It's a state committee for industrial agriculture. And there I found that the food supply was quite quickly saturated with radioactive contaminants from Chernobyl. Um, For instance, meat. They slaughtered 100,000 head of livestock in the weeks after the accident because the livestock were contaminated and they were sickly and, you know, getting sores and bald patches and they didn't look well. So they slaughtered them. They should have disposed of this, these carcasses as, as radioactive waste inside the Chernobyl zone, but they didn't. They, it was a poor country and, and meat was, you know, everybody wanted meat on their tables in the Soviet Union. People craved it. So they issued a, an instruction manual and that's where the title Manual for Survival comes from. There are so many instruction manuals for a new phase of human existence and that's how to survive a post-nuclear accident, you know, how to live a post-apocalyptic survival, you know, methods. And so this one was for meat packers, an instruction manual. So take the, the, the meat, grade it by radioactivity, the most heavily radioactive meat, put in freezers and wait out the decay periods. Um, the low and medium level meat mix with clean meat until you get to a permissible norm and then uh, label it as you normally would and distribute it across the Soviet Union, but don't send it to Moscow. That's where the big leaders, of course, lived. The, quickly from Gomol and Zhitomir, they're asking for more freezers because they have so much you know, heavily radioactive meat and they don't get more freezers. So they find a train car and they stuff in 60 tons of radioactive meat and they send it south to the Caucasus. In Baku, they don't want it. and Yerevan, they don't want it. Tbilisi, they don't want it. This ghost train of radioactive meat circulated the Soviet Union for three years, mm. homeless, till it was finally brought back to Ukraine. It was stored, they put a fence around it and the refrigeration broke down. Now you have rotting and radioactive meat. Finally, the KGB in 1990 buried it inside the Chernobyl zone where it should have gone in the first place. Mm. I found that there were 200 uh, wool workers in a relatively clean town of Chernia, 50 miles away from the this accident site, who were given status as liquidators. That's people who were, you know, officially given subsidies because they had cleaned up the accident and received exposures because of their, you know, their work. And I was like, how did that happen? These were mostly women, they're wool workers in a clean town, pretty far from the accident. So I drove up there and found that these workers had been cleaning bales of wool that measured 3.2 
milli rotingen an hour. And that's like, you know, hugging many times a day an x-ray machine while it's turned on. Mm. And these women, um, you know, there was only 10 of the 200 on the list who were still at their jobs. I said, what, where's everybody else? And they said, oh, they've mostly died or they're, they're invalids on pensions. Mm. And um, they told me, you know, um, all kinds of things that the management um, had failed to remember, you know, what happened to, you know, they cleaned this wool to, for, you know, to, to make it you know, viable for commercial use, but they uh, did not um, clean the radioactive wastewater that came out of the factory. And that went into the municipal drinking water supply. Mm. Um, and they, they kept the, the really radioactive wool in a big mound for 18 months, right next to where the workers were loading and unloading the, um, the, the storage bins. And so that was a real problem um, for, uh, you know, for all kinds of distribution, you know, mechanisms that worked throughout. So I found that happened on all kinds of levels, whether it was wool or leather, meat, uh, radioactive wheat went all the way to Greece. Um, it was grown in Greece and then, you know, it was shipped to Italy. The Italians didn't want it. So finally the Dutch bought it and shipped it to Africa as aid. So it wasn't just the Soviets who were trying to sort of, you know, save um, and reuse radioactively contaminated uh, produce. And that's there. part of what makes this project such a challenge and, and probably why it's taken a number of books to research is this official Chernobyl fatality count, you know, is so low. You had 54 and, and, but we, there, I mean, it touches so many people. So how can one possibly uh, trace or, or, you know, you're pretty clear in the book. You say, well, this is a correlation, so it doesn't necessarily prove it, but it, it certainly creates questions. What are some of the ways that you kind of uh, trace these and, and sort of trace the levels of transmission that's happening? Well, I, you know, I was really confused because what the, the local researchers are saying is we have a public health disaster on our hands. And, and they come out with that headline around about 1990. And it, that headline also emerged from the classified records. And I was like, well, how did that happen? You know, there was really a, a public health disaster among 4.5 million people that the world didn't, doesn't really recognize. You know, the UN says only 35 people died. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they say 54 people died. And a couple thousand kids got sick with, with easily treatable thyroid mm -hmm. cancer. No big deal. We should continue. They use Chernobyl to, con to make a case for continuing um, on, you know, a, a nuclear renaissance. But so I went to the UN archives and I, I said, you know, like, you know, why don't we know this story? And I worked my way through five UN archives. And, and what I found is that international uh, scientific administrators and scientists work to help Soviet leaders minimize the impact, the health impacts, especially of the disaster. Um, they did things like get biopsies of kids with cancer, bring them home, they checked out, and then they wrote reports saying, you know, we only heard rumors of, of pediatric thyroid cancer, but those were anecdotal in nature. And they did that when they had the evidence in hand. Um, when, you know, when the Soviet uh, scientists sent in their research for the big, um, UN study that was reviewing Chernobyl health effects, they dismissed it. So, you know, if they had a big study of about a compendium of about 600 pages, they, you know, cut it in half, cutting out most of this research from local researchers who were on the ground, who had the, who had long, you know, themselves long-term exposures and had, um, you know, five years of, of work on, on the topic. They um, went around and made sure that, um, funding for a big proposed uh, epidemiological study of the long-term health effects of the Chernobyl disaster did not get funded. You know, we call that undone science, science that should have been done, that was, you know, by different kinds of mechanisms was um, worked to make sure it wasn't done because, you know, what if we find something? What's going to happen? We'd have to shut down nuclear industries. There's also a lot of lawsuits. I was, you know, looking for the motives. Why would the the international, the big UN powers do this. And I found that in the early 1990s, at the end of the Cold War, when the archives were opened, 
there are all kinds of lawsuits um, and the big UN powers, the US, UK, France, and Russia were facing lawsuits from people who had been exposed by the, from the decades of nuclear weapons production and nuclear weapons testing. And these lawsuits were threatening to bury um, you know, billions of dollars and you know, would set precedents that would make it very difficult to continue nuclear production in the future. So they had um, a strong incentive to make Chernobyl go, the Chernobyl health problems go away. And, and that's indeed what happened. It was quite a quite successful political project, but the scientific questions are still there and they're still um, left unanswered. And so I, at the end of Manual for Survival, I'm, I'm left wondering why we're not more curious, um, that advocating that we should press our leaders to finally answer these questions about chronic exposures to low doses of radioactivity, because that, as opposed to the Hiroshima situation, is a far more likely scenario for our future. We're, we're more likely to be exposed to, to a slow drip of radioactivity in our neighborhoods than a big nuclear explosion. Hmm. And, and you see that kind of with uh, your example in Plutopia where uh, you know people kind of move away from the city a little bit, but the river, the Columbia River is still you know, roaring through and, and um, the nature, I mean, it kind of sticks around. Um, mm -hmm. and, and even in the case of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it is different in a lot of ways, but it's similar. And you mentioned there's, there's not really a, a case file for that at the National Archives. Um, yes, but, yeah. but presumably someone did some sort of studying. So how, how do you balance this uh, act of, of being an investigative, you know, sort of historian going after these answers, but at the same time, uh, avoiding this, this categorization as a duped a comrade, you know, you're, you're not listening to what the government says. And a lot of times those people are pushed away as uh, conspiracy theorists. Yeah, that's what I've been tagged since this book has been out. I'm, I've been equated to an anti-vaxxer. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's been really odd experiences. The book has been out for about two months and I've been, there's been a lot of press about the book um, and I've been attacked, you know, in the, you know, sort of viral comment sections of, of newspapers and, and book review sections um, as somebody who, you know, doesn't know the science, isn't a scientist herself, um, who is, uh, you know, anti-nuclear activist, um, or, you know, it's a conspiracy theorist, that kind of stuff. And, um, and this, it's been interesting because I've, it's almost as if I've become a character in the, in the history that I've, I've written. <laughs> and this is exactly how the Soviet scientists and the Western scientists who said, yeah, there is a, a, a thyroid epidemic among children. You know, in 1989, it became clear. It took till 1996 for the UN experts to recognize that childhood cancer epidemic. That meant lots of kids went unmonitored, lots of kids got treated, you know, far later than they should have. And many of them, you know, not many, but several dozen died because of these um, thyroid cancers that, that probably shouldn't have died. And so these kinds of denials um, and work by slandering people, by calling them unprofessional, by questioning their credentials, um, ad hominem attacks, um, you know, sort of large scale labeling somebody as a, as a, you know, as an anti-nuke activist. I've never been an anti-nuke activist. I, I don't take any money from any kind of organization that, that is an anti-nuclear organization. <clears throat> In fact, many of the people who are attacking me do get paid by, um, hmm. grants from nuclear, um, organizations or, 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 or work directly for nuclear lobbies. So um, this is the kind of, these are the kind of tactics that they dealt with when scientists popped up in the 1980s and 1990s saying that there's a problem in Chernobyl. And I'm being treated to the same kind of uh, recipe. And, um, and that's been really, I guess, disheartening. Hmm. The other thing that's been disheartening is that many of the people who've criticized my book have only read the, the two critical reviews of my book, but they haven't actually read the book itself. Hmm. with its 70 pages of footnotes. Um, the book is just filled with primary material. 
And, um, and I was very careful because I, I anticipated this kind of criticism. I was very careful to, to document every statement I made. So when I say that the minimum death count for Chernobyl is 35,000 dead, that's because the Chernobyl, the, the Ukrainian government gives uh, compensation to spouses of people who have died from a Chernobyl related um, illness to 35,000 people. Now that's a minimum number because that only includes people who were old enough to marry people who um, had documented exposures, and people who lived in Ukraine. Belarus and Western Russia received far more Chernobyl radioactivity than Ukraine, and, and those countries don't have a count. Hmm. So 35,000 is, is at the very low end uh, of numbers. Not 35, but 35,000. And you have this like sort of horrifying <laughs> anecdote where the, you know, you could be eating uh, berries that are grown in this, in this area. Um, how is Chernobyl a global story now? And um, I mean, I think that kind of supports your claim that we need to be asking questions. Yeah, I was um, one of those trips to northern Ukraine in summer. Uh, we noticed that all these people, I mean, thousands of people were gathering berries from the, the swampy forests around, you know, pretty far from, from the Chernobyl plan, about 200, 300 kilometers away in the northern Rivni province. <clears throat> and so we, you know, were curious about that and decided to go undercover blueberry picking ourselves. And so off we went with baskets and picked berries and sold them to the buyers who were lining the forest roads. Each buyer has a van, buys about two tons a day, and then delivers them to a warehouse. So we fire, followed the buyers to the warehouse, and there, the, the, at the warehouse, they were, had a Geiger counter, and they were wanding all the baskets of berries. Um, and I asked the woman, you know, who was doing that work, how many of these berries are radioactive? She said, you know, all the berries are radioactive, but, but some are really radioactive, like 3,000 becquerels a kilogram. And in Ukraine at the time, the, the permissible norm was 450 becquerels a kilogram. Mm. So we stood around and watched, and, and I noticed that they, put, they, they bought all the berries, whether they were above this permissible norm or below it. And they bought the ones that were above the norm at lower prices. Mm. And I asked the pickers, like, what are they going to do with those dirty berries? And, and they said, well, they just mix them with clean berries, and they get to the, to the norm, and then they can sell them abroad into the to Poland and where it enters the EU markets. Um, and the EU has a higher norm, which in 2016 became 1,250 becquerels a kilogram. And so now, you know, that, that's, that Chernobyl story gets a little closer to, you know, Europeans' breakfast tables because you could be eating, you know, European could be eating a berry with 3,000 becquerels a kilogram. You know, probably not so bad if you eat one or two, but... Um, troublesome nonetheless. Then I talked to a, a guy who was a specialist in, in homeland security, a, a nuclear radiation specialist, and he said, yeah, yeah, we had a, a big truck pass from, the, from Canada over the U.S. into, the, you know, across the border not long ago and had inside of it a big radiating mass. I said, oh, really, what was in it? He goes, berries from Ukraine. <laughs> And, it, you know, I said, well, what did you do? He goes, well, they were within the permissible norm, which for the U.S. is 1,250 becquerels a kilogram. And so we let it in. So now that Chernobyl story, which is, you know, usually something we see as out there, as, as safely contained, if not within the Chernobyl zone, then within the, the boundaries of other nation states. Now suddenly the, those, the global markets have brought those, that Chernobyl history much closer to our American breakfast tables. And, and that gets people, I wrote that story because I actually don't think, you know, that, you know, a few radioactive berries are, are that harmful <laughs> unless, unless you feed them maybe to an infant or something. Yeah. But it, it's troubling nonetheless that we think of, um, you know, that we are aware of these problems and that we have them, you know, in our backyards. And, that, and that's what the story of um, the global spread of, of contaminants of all kinds, including radioactivity, has done, has made our lives and our bodies and our environments um, chemically and radioactively toxic. And what I found, you know, what really shocked me as I, as I was finishing this book is that in the course of, of producing and testing, especially testing nuclear weapons, 
the big nuclear powers, especially the Soviet Union and the United States, detonated at least 500 times worth of Chernobyl contaminants, oh. Chernobyl sized contaminants into the environment. And those contaminants circled the, mostly the Northern Hemisphere and came down where it rained. And, you know, the Soviets tested bombs in Kazakhstan and, and in uh, the Nova Zemlya in the, in the far north. And the Americans tested bombs in the Marshall Islands and, and in uh, the French tested bombs in, in Algeria and uh, the South Pacific and the British in Western Australia and the South Pacific. And the Americans were, were really interesting in that they were the only ones brave enough to open up a nuclear proving ground in the continental U.S., and all kinds of scientists were, were, were voted against that. And so that, that's not a wise decision. But after the Korean War, it, it seemed like a, you know, a, a pragmatic response. You know, we need to have a, a secure testing ground for nuclear weapons. And so they opened the, the Nevada test site in 1951. And there's a lot of attention on, on Nevada and, and Utah uh, in terms of downwinders. But what I found is that the Atomic Energy Commission was writing in the 1950s that you know, the hot spot for radioactivity was not ground zero in Nevada, nor, you know, immediately downwind in Utah, but in Minnesota. Mm. And that's because the, the winds took, quickly took the radioactive fallout that went into the stratosphere and sent it 1,500 miles north and east. And the first place it rained down, it was in the humid Midwest, was Minnesota. Mm. And there, you know, sheep were, were acting like sheep in Utah. They were, they were getting sores. They were falling ill. The, the lambs were born with birth defects or the lambs just failed to thrive and die. Um, mm. We find that, you know, radioactive contaminants from the Nevada test site were um, just as strong in Tennessee and upstate New York as they were in Nevada at, the, at ground zero. Mm -hmm. um, and what you find when you look at the you know, global health statistics in the late 20th century is that there are climbing rates of um, strange and possibly radiogenetic maladies. Uh, childhood leukemia used to be a medical rarity. Doctors used to run in the 1930s when they found a child with leukemia because it was so rare and interesting. Now, of course, you know, on buses, you know, we see ads for um, with bald children yeah. advertising chemotherapies. Um, childhood cancers in general have been rising. Childhood cancers are, are not because of longevity. They're not because of um, improved diagnosis. Those just didn't happen um, very often at all before um, the 1950s. Yeah. Find rising rates of thyroid cancers, uh, of birth defects, um, mostly in the northern hemisphere. And, and a really strange statistic too, also radiogenetic possibly, is uh, male sperm counts have dropped in half since mm. 1945. Again, only in the northern hemisphere. Now, there, this is a, a correlation with the spread of, of radioactive contaminants around the world. But whether there, it's a causation, that's left to be you know, discovered. And, and that's because there just has not been the research. We have not been curious enough to ask those questions. And yeah, and I get that sense from your book that that's, uh, you know, you're pushing, you're asking the questions and you're giving this sort of like baseline with, with correlations and evidence and archives that people can pursue. Now, one thing you've mentioned a lot is sort of how the governments are working and, and kind of manipulating these operations. What about the non-government organizations? Like Greenpeace shows up in your book. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about organizations that aren't necessarily directly tied to government. Yeah, you know, Greenpeace, um, I noticed, opened the, was the first NGO to, you know, to officially register in the Soviet Union, and they were the first uh, Western entity to open a lab in um, Ukraine, in, in the Chernobyl lands. And they were sort of racing the International Atomic Energy Agency to come to some observations and to, and to do some tests there. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. So I went to Amsterdam to work in their archives. And what I found was a really tragic story. And there, there are two parts to the story. The first is, is what I described with the student educational exchange, is that it was really hard for a Western nonprofit to understand and figure out how to function in the Soviet system. You know, everything 
everything was different. Like just even technically how to, how to plug in a machine, you know, how to convert, um, you know, numbers and to translate was really difficult. And, and, and Greenpeace just struggled with it uh, immensely. The second problem, and, and, that, and that struggle meant that they, you know, you know, it took them a long time. And at, at first they, they just failed to come up with any pertinent observations. The second problem was that the KGB um, ve got very nervous about um, protecting their, their scientific data and their intellectual property, which they considered to be, you know, Chernobyl blood tests and, 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 and citizens, you know, who, you know, um, examining citizens in the Chernobyl territory, that was considered scientific data and intellectual property. So they infiltrated the Greenpeace organization and, um, and basically sabotaged the work of Greenpeace for um, the first several years to make sure that nothing much happened at all. <laughs> so with the best of intentions, Greenpeace ends up not able to do much um, on that front. And um, until really um, several years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and until Greenpeace um, you know, hired people who knew Slavic languages and hired um, people who were not um, uh, KGB agents and and then they started to do very good work and and the same similar story with Red Cross um, you know they came in they were uh, sort of uh, easily convinced by um, industry scientists that there was no problem but then when they did open up clinics and labs you know in contaminated grounds the people who were there were were started to say and write reports like there's a big problem here that's not being addressed mm -hmm. and we need to address it. Um, so I'm not saying that there was an international conspiracy that was writ large, that was you know, pervasive through all the government agencies. I'm really saying that there are a few key and extremely influential opinion makers who managed to make sure that um, the people who said that there were problems were discredited, that the people who proposed uh, and agencies that proposed long-term and serious studies, that those studies didn't get funded. Um, and that evidence that did emerge was either minimized, discredited, or, or just plain hidden. Hmm. And I think those, those big voices are really important with, with one of the main points of this book is that um, sometimes technology yeah, is kind of promoted as, as infallible or, or uh, you know, perfect. But a lot of times we don't know that for a fact. What is Chernobyl in the out, you know, the aftermath warn us about technology in the future? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, and this is where I think the environmental humanities is becoming more and more important, is that we've been led to believe, you know, really, you know, since the dawn of the Cold War, that the answer to solutions is, is to be found in, in new technologies and new science, and, and, and that we will, you know, come up with a solution. And so for a long time, you know, they produced, you know, nuclear reactors, and the nuclear reactors produced nuclear waste, and scientists confidently said, don't worry, we don't know what to do with this nuclear waste, but we'll figure it out. I mean, look what we've done in just a few years with their vaulting um, leaps in science. We have produced these reactors and figured out what a chain, how to make a chain reaction and produce all this power. Um, and these terrific bombs and this, these terrific reactors that produce so much energy, we'll figure out what to do with the waste. And, and that hasn't happened now. It's been over 70 years, and we don't have uh, solutions to what to do with our nuclear waste. And, um, and the same thing with climate change. You know, we're, we're offered all kinds of technological solutions, um, and those technological solutions are untested. We don't know what the the fallout from those solutions will be in terms of environmental damage and health damage in the future. And I think what people in the humanities can do is they can um, look back, uh, give the wider context, um, show how these kinds of solutions that have been tried in the past have, have come up with problems. And they can suggest through their work alternative possibilities, alternative futures that we don't have to repeat the mistakes of our past, that we have um, other possibilities that in the past we did not explore. Um, you know, I, I think, for instance, that we'll want to return to indigenous knowledge and indigenous skills that have been um, 
shunted and discredited in the past as, you know, kind of, you know, you know, having no credibility, having no sort of uh, basis in Western scientific fact in quotation marks. Um, but I think more and more we're, we're going to return to these kinds of sources. And, and to do that, it, it requires people with our skills and, and, the, and the sort of long-term depth of knowledge that the humanities provides. Hmm. Yeah, it's so important, especially uh, mixing it with that scientific knowledge and, and working together. Absolutely. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're drawing close to the end of the hour here, but which means we get to make a suggestion. So um, if you, you have the opportunity to suggest to the Hour of History listeners, of which they're all over the world, uh, what suggestion would you make? It could be anything. Well, I guess, you know, it, it, this pitch for environmental humanities, uh, environmental history, um, history of technology and science, you know, I, I myself, you, you might think to yourself, well, I, I can't do that. I don't have any training in science. I, I'll leave that to you know, scientists. Um, and I think that's where, that's where we need to, to change our thinking. And just, you know, I myself have no background uh, in science. I, I have no um, formal training uh, at the university level in, in science. Um, but, and I, and I mean that, you know, as a disclaimer, not as a disclaimer, but as a, as a call to arms, like that, that this knowledge can be acquired, that we can, you know, study and learn and make alliances with scientists, um, call up scientists and, and ask them questions and, um, and ask them to collaborate with us. And I think that those collaborations are, are going to become more and more important in the future and that we should be open to them. Hmm. I think that's a great suggestion. I, uh, th along those lines, my suggestion is is pretty similar, and it's this idea. Whereas you're you're both suggesting, you know, you go for it and you talk to people, which is another thing you do very well in the book. Is you you are talking to scientists and you are um, learning the material. My suggestion actually is to use the tools that are now so widely available. Um, and in that, you know, sort of when I was reading your book and looking in these uh, places that I'm, I'm unfamiliar with, with this area of the world, and I look and, you know, Google has street view of, of <laughs> Chernobyl. Right. Uh, it's, and it's absolutely fascinating. And this is available to everyone. You know, if you have an internet connection, you can go and walk through the, the exclusion zone um, and see things. And, you know, of course, it's, it's an image from 2015 or whatever, but uh, I'm reminded of that, like, fascinating story where, where a, a student in Britain found, uh, you know, used geo and analytics to, to find inconsistencies in sort of the forest in Central America that eventually led to a, a rediscovery of these Mayan temples. So I think Maybe. the tools are out there, exactly. And, and I just, I'm always encouraging people to just kind of, you have to mess around on it, uh, mess around with it. And, uh, and I mean, you spent so many years talking to so many people. Uh, with that in mind, uh, where, where do you go after Chernobyl, after this, uh, after these global contaminated berries, what's next for you? Well, I'm going to go back to the forest, but hopefully clean forest. And I'm interested in uh, what I call plant people, people who um, now that science scientists have uh, validated the idea that plants are sentient, have distributed intelligence, communicate with one, with one another and have fantastic sensory perception skills. Um, I, I'm, I, that brings me to the thought that, you know, Ukrainian peasants have known that for a long time, for hundreds of years. And so I want to go back in time and look at people who, um, who've, who've communicated with plants and, and, and had a, a relationship with the, with the plant world for centuries. And I, and I, I do that because I think, as I said before, that we're going to need to rely on indigenous skills and indigenous knowledge to help us solve the ecological crisis of, the, of, the, of our present time. Well, nice. That's a good, hopeful note. Um, it's a pleasure to have you on the Hour of History. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, that's it. Thank you very much for your time, Michael. Thank you so much. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Kate Brown, and the book is Manual for Survival, A Chernobyl Guide to the Future. Her other books will be linked to as well on hourofhistory.com. Thanks for listening on Hour of History. It's our world, anytime, anyplace. <laughs>
Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out our recommendations page at ourhistory.com forward slash rex. That's ourhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. There you'll find links to the books mentioned during the podcast. And if you choose to purchase one, you'll be supporting the podcast in the process. And if you still haven't gotten your fill of the Hour of History, make sure you head over to the Hour of History blog found at hourofhistory.com forward slash blog with articles being released fairly often on topics relating to those covered in the podcast as well as others. With that, we conclude this episode and hope to have you back for the next one. Take care. And again, thanks for listening to the Hour of History podcast. 